thing, y'all can look at that. I, and the only thing on that slide is that I do need to know those seven warning signs. It's on the notes page too. And it's in Iggy on table 23-9. And, and um, so you do need to, to know that, that caution thing. And you don't necessarily have to memorize it word for word, but know what's included in it, because it, I'll, I'll promise you it will be one of the in a multiple choice fashion, so it, yeah, you, need to, you need to be familiar with that for real And um, with the complementary um, health practices part on the next page, I'll let you look at the, and, um, a, a lot of that, but the testimonies for radon and and um, encouraging clients to learn more about their family history. Um, that's where people that have been adopted and all are, are really kind of trying to go back and find out um, where they came from so that they will, will have more information on, on that as well. Um, but um, but anyway, let, read over those complementary um, health practices. That's really a, a teaching um, sort of thing. That's not necessarily uh, one of those woo-woo granola eater with granola head things. It's just, just common sense sort of things. Eat more fruits and vegetables, and a minimum of five servings a day. All, all those kinds of things. We've already talked about that in some of the things. So, so um, definitely um, recommend the screenings uh, for early detection, like the, the real self-exam in the tax year and uh, testicular self-exams and, and skin exams. We that, you put that on there, but, but um, when we talk about the skin cancer, we'll the skin exam too. Um, and I, I'm going to back up to, uh, on that next page, the, you need to recommend a balanced diet is tolerated for cancer patients. You want them to eat real food if it's all, at all possible, and so, some of them can't. And sometimes you, you just have to allow them to eat what they will eat and then then supplement with maybe liquid supplements or whatever. But if if it's at all possible, try to get them to eat real food because eating a whole food, like a whole apple or a whole orange or whatever, is better for all of us because you get the fiber, you get all kinds of, of um, it's just packed with all kinds of nutrients if you, if you eat the peeling and all that sort of thing. So, so the whole food, that is going to develop. <laughs> but still, that it really is better for us. It's better for cancer patients if they can eat real food. But you want them to eat good real food. But if they, can, if they only want ice cream or they only want they eat dessert or pudding or something like that, sometimes it's better than, than nothing. If they won't take their supplements and they want to eat sugary, yucky things or whatever, that maybe that's just all they can they can muster. But um, we do we do certainly want to recommend that they they have a high carb high protein diet, but we want them to eat good carbs that they can do. Like we talked about the whole grains for the in the elimination unit, of course, for obvious reasons. And and um, you know if they're if they're not eating well, they're going to have problems with elimination and all too. So, so you've got to have to consider all, all of those things that you learned in the past as well. But the high carb, high protein will help if the um, if they are becoming infected. And we talked about the cancer cells robbing the body of the nutrients. And so if they can have a high-calorie, high high-protein diet, then that, that, can, um, that can certainly um, assist them to, to tolerate their treatment better or to tolerate their cancer experience better if, if they're eating. But, you know, if they get to a terminal phase and they just can't, then that's a whole different story. So um, I think y'all did your content, some of your site content deals with some of that, doesn't it? Within the blight or something? Because... Mm -hmm. Um, I, I looked at some of that that Ms. Um, Rumble had, I had. It's been a while since I looked at it, but but um, I think they they talk about you know it talks about what you what you do and how you deal with end of life um, nutrition and all of that kind of thing, and just let people people do what they can do or what they want to do and, and keep them comfortable. So so um, you know not everybody's going to be able to do the high carb high protein, but if possible, that's what you can do. So. Um, and then the antioxidant foods and vitamins and supplements in, in, the, in the larger doses than recommended daily allowance, you would think that that would be a good thing for a cancer patient, but if they are on treatment, if they are on radiation therapy or chemotherapy, part of the way that radiation and chemo kills cells is an oxidative process. So do you want to interfere with that anti- um, or by, by giving an antioxidant, um, if you give them an antioxidant in large, large doses, 
very, in theory anyway, it may interfere with the cell kill that you could have gotten from the radiation and the chemotherapy. I don't think they've ever got real proof of that. They've been arguing about that for years, whether you should have got recommended in high doses of vitamins and um, other antioxidant foods in huge amounts. I mean, we want to eat a balanced diet that includes antioxidant foods, but just to take those huge, huge mega doses of antioxidant vitamins is not a, not a good idea. Um, so uh, and that's, that's still still the recommendation, um, even, even now, even though that's not, not something that's been proven, but, but um, if, it, if it really is antioxidant, then you don't want to you don't want to interfere with the with the therapy, and they can go back on on some um, higher doses of supplements if they're not on therapy. That that would be okay. All right. Collaborative care of cancer. We're out for either cure or control or palliation. So um, palliation is is. Um, we talk about palliative care and hospice care. We'll get into that in 211 AD in a lot more detail. But, but just the palliation is just relieving and control the symptoms. Sometimes you give therapy just to just to relieve the um, relieve the symptoms. And and it may may be that there's no way that they're going to be cured. There's no way it's going to be controlled. It's just going to relieve the symptoms. Okay, now who who am I thinking of that, that I have a clinical that that patient just got a palliative treatment yesterday? Who's, are you paying attention there? Yeah, I think I am. <laughs> okay. I'm picking up here. But you you have to go, right? To radiation? I did. And what did her patient have? A brain tumor. Brain tumor, yeah. And she's not she's a DNR, isn't she? So that, that means we're not doing curative or control, we're doing the palliative, yeah, it's palliative therapy. Yep, okay. It's, it's a neat point from the clinical that's what we're going to talk about, isn't it? Okay. So the, the definition for the goal of cancer therapy, though, is to either increase survival time, if possible, or increase the quality of life. And that's what they're trying to do for a patient patient because she's got a lot of increasing intracranial pressure. She's taking steroids to decrease the what? Yeah, they would really caught that right right away while the steroids were being given to her. No, he really uh, knew, he focused right in on what was going on there. Um, but anyway, um, that if she can get the decrease of um, intracranial pressure from uh, the radiation along with the steroids, then hopefully she'll have a better quality of life, and that's what they're after for her. Um, so, so um, curative control or palliation. Control means that you may have to continue on therapy for the rest of your life, but um, there's so many new therapies out that some people take therapy up until like a week before they die and don't really get a chance to have much hospice care because they're responding to therapy um, for, for a long, long time, and then they um, then they just all of a sudden sort of fall off the cliff kind of thing, and then they, they die within a week of stopping their last therapy, and that, that's not all, always ideal for, for um, the death experience, but, but you don't want to, if something's working, you don't want to stop it, though, or if it's maintaining their, their current level of functioning and all, you don't want to to stop it. So there, that's somewhat controversial, of course, too. Okay, this is a really busy wacko slide, so you don't have to memorize this. It's just giving you a diagram of if you're out, if you're um, out for cure, this, these are the things that you do. If you're out for control, these are the things that you you do. If you're out for palliation, this is what you do. So I'm not going to. I mean, y'all can look at that yourself. I'm, that's not like on the test directly. It's just to help you maybe understand the concept a little better. So, um, the, the collaborative care means we're all working for, as a team with, with different um, disciplines and different medical disciplines and then um, with, with uh, risk before care and really with social workers and that sort of thing too. So, the main three kinds of treatments are surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And that's over those page. So, chemotherapy really is, is if, if you you can break down the chemotherapy into multiple, multiple categories. Now, um, pharmacotherapy is probably a better word for it because you can use biologic treatments, um, targeted therapies, hormonal therapies, and the chemotherapy is usually considered the cytotoxic. What, it, what does cytotoxic mean? Kill cells. Kill cells, exactly. Yeah. 
So, all right. Collaborative lips on the wrong way. Ah. Okay. There we go. So, ther surgical therapy. We're going to cure or control disease. Um, so, it is a localized form of therapy, of course, because you're not going to cut up the whole body, I hope. <laughs> you know, you're gonna, it's a localized therapy. Um, and it's usually for cancers that are at a slow rate of growth. Um, or tumors that are present on nerves or airways, even if it's a palliative thing. It, it, um, it may be to, to uh, relieve the airway or relieve the, the GI tract. Um, my husband's grandfather just showed up um, at the doctor's office just orange as a pumpkin, and, and um, he was 89 years old, and he had a, a, a blocked bile duct from pancreatic cancer, is what they um, figured out it was. And so um, the doctor wanted to just do a palliative treatment for the, um, because when you got all that bile in your, in your bloodstream and your jaundice, what happens to your skin? It's, it's itchy and, and um, real uncomfortable. And uh, you can have some of those bile salts to come out in your sweat and then it irritates the skin and all that. So he was doing it as a palliative thing. But my in-laws were on a cruise. And so they, um, we didn't want them to put him to sleep at 89 years old and have this, this surgery because you know, what if he is, you know, the, it's a risk of death anytime you put under anesthesia, especially for an 89 year old man. So we, we just begged, it was Dr. Kyle Black, Dr. Phil Black's dad, um, we begged him to just wait until they were able to get back from their cruise before they actually did the surgery. And, and that was a good idea because he never woke up and he was weeping from every pore and all this kind of stuff. And, well, um, that was a, a bad situation. I kept him on a ventilator on, in ICU because the, the two daughters didn't want to um, give him up, and um, he, they never never re regained consciousness. So, so that that was an attempted palliation, but it didn't work out. So, it, it, sometimes you just have to make your best judgment. Um, the, the family wanted to do everything that, that they could. So, but anyway, um, if if you're trying to cure the cancer, though want to make sure that when you take out the tumor that there is a margin of normal tissue surrounding it. So sometimes they'll go in and, and, um, and take a piece of, of a tumor or take a biopsy like a biopsy where they actually remove the tumor that they can see and then look at it and if there's not a certain margin of normal tissue they'll go back in. You see that a lot with skin cancers, don't you? With especially like melanoma. Um, you'll, you'll see them to, to make sure that they've got a, a, a real big margin. That's why they really gouge out big big areas sometimes and you, you have a, a real defect in the skin after, um, after having melanomas. Um, but this, they've done um, surgery for, for um, cancer I can't remember how long ago or even even said when I, I did that before. It's like they've seen Egyptian wounds that have like the wrist of the wounds and one wrist of the wounds and then they could tell you that the, the person that had cancer. So it's been it's really, really an old form of, of um, a therapy for, for cancer. And then when you're doing prophylactic, that means that you're, you're going to try to, to prevent the uh, cancer. Um, if there's a, a strong family disposition, predisposition. Some people in the, the BRCA1, a BRCA2 with the breast cancer um, risk that they'll have um, they'll have a prophylactic mastectomy. That's a really really drastic decision to have to make. Um, but there are. Do you remember a real famous person that recently Angelina had that Jolie. done? Angelina Jolie. Her mom died from breast cancer, and she's positive for BRCA1 or two, BRCA1. But anyway, that's what she's doing. Uh, sometimes they'll have their ovaries taken out too because that is a hormonal influence um, mm -hmm. in the tumors in the tumors in the tumors as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then colon polyps and molds from the protected areas and things like that are both prevented from having the prophylactic get my P words right. And then you can have surgery for biopsies, of course, like I just said. And then the curative is where you get all the visible and microscopic tumor taken out or, or destroyed. And it, it's really cool. I went to a conference in Atlanta several summers ago. Um, it was Northside Hospital. It was a great, great conference. And it had this surgeon that um, had, had gotten, had a problem with it, um, his cervical vertebrae. And, you know, just bending over patients. I think he did. I think he was a urologist and did like prostate surgeries and stuff like that. Um, but he, he had to lean over and he had a real problem with um, 
his vertebrae and, and had to have surgery, and then um, they had to have a fusion and wasn't able to really bend over and physically do the surgery the way that he'd done in the past. So he convinced the hospital to get into a program with a robotic um, surgery. And it's just like playing a video game where you can remotely um, work on the patient with the robot, just like the like, uh, controllers to um, put the video game. And, and it was just the coolest thing, and he was able to to um, save a lot of function too, like decrease impotence um, and incontinence that people have after prostate cancer surgery. So, so um, it was kind of a, it was a win-win for the patients and for, for him and for the hospital being able to offer that that um, new kind of a, a surgical procedure. So, okay, here we go. You want to take only as much as you have to, and then um, sometimes if they're if it is a real high risk, if the, if the tumor is large or they have a high mitotic index, we were talking about that, and they divide a little more often, um, then, then they may want to, to treat with um, whatever the standard is for that of cancer and that, that mitotic index um, with radiation therapy and chemotherapy after the, the surgery. And they, they actually have one called um, neoadjuvant surgery where they um, actually do radiation therapy or chemotherapy before the surgery to shrink it as much as possible so that the surgery doesn't have to be as intense or as, as extensive. Um, and then we do, we, we talked about the cysts to, to try to remove any cysts um, <coughs> intact. Even if you don't know that they're cancerous, try to, to keep cysts intact in case the, there's cancer cells in it. And then um, the, you may take out samples of, of lymph nodes um, at, along with the, um, the, the surgical procedure as well. Okay, um, with control, you're, you're out for sometimes just taking the bulk away just so it's not putting pressure on um, there or making um, the patient a little uncomfortable. Um, and, and, um, you might leave some tumor behind in that situation. It's, it's going to be um, um, well, it, for, in some cases, it's to, to just have less tumor there to have to treat, and the radiation and chemotherapy can, can treat it um, uh, in a, a much more um, focused way and um, in, if it's a smaller amount of, of um, tumor cells left. And then, of course, the palliative, we said, it improves the quality of life, but that's not the length, not the length of life. Um, so if they got to swallowing difficulties or whatever, or, uh, pain, obstructions, um, you have to um, have to decide if it if it's um, if it's worth it and, and uh, talk to the patient about it and let them make the decision. Um, and then the adjuvant treatment when you use it um, in addition to surgery, you use the radiation or chemotherapy. Um, Dr. Black would always say we're doing this to stack the odds more in your favor after the surgery because we know that this kind of cancer. This growth rate and all that, if it could have spread, or maybe likely to have spread if it was a larger tumor, um, or if it was in some of the lymph nodes. Um, there's, there's all kinds of decision making that the surgeons and, and the oncologists have to make with all of that. But <clears throat> anyway, that's that's when, when the intent is cure, though, there's a lot of times that um, adjunctive um, therapy after, after surgery if the, the patient has certain risk factors. And then the second look surgery, you remember we talked about the, um, the other day about, about the seeding along the omentum in the abdomen, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you can actually go back in. Sometimes that's the only way to really see, because like I said, if, if it's, it has to be at least this big around and, and to really see it on the scan, and it's your little finger that big in the cells. Um, so, so sometimes I have to just go in and see if they, there's a change, because they probably had surgery in the first place, and go open it back up and actually look. That's, that's pretty, pretty invasive, but sometimes that's the only way to, to tell. Hopefully you can do some blood tests um, if it's an ovarian cancer, like CA-125 or um, CA-15-3. Um, sometimes that can tell you if, if, they, if there's less, um, less tumor there, if, it, if they, those were elevated um, at the baseline and then they go down. Uh, you may not have to do the second like, surgery if the patient's not having symptoms. But, um, you all can also can do reconstructive or rehabilitative surgery. Um, it increase the function and enhance the appearance and, and all that, like breast, breast reconstruction after mastectomy and uh, penile implants after nerve damage from the prostate surgery. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to give you too much information saying this, but I'm watching. Yeah, it was John Stewart yesterday. 
He he was um, talking about that that uh, all of these some of these groups were were um, were fussing at Medicare for for pay for for um, vacuum pumps for for um, for patients that were um, were impotent so that they could have have erections and, and all that and and, um, and that was that was different than than what a prostate cancer person would have they would have to do, do the, um, the the pump kind of thing instead of the instead of the vacuum they would have to do with, um, other kinds of of uh, surgical kind of things because of the nerve damage and all but but still. Um, you know, that, that's one of those things that they pay for for breast reconstruction surgery that Medicare has to pay for that. They, they've really got, breast cancer has lots and lots of advocacy groups. And so they, they really can get get a lot of reimbursement, but, but now we're, you know, hopefully hopefully they're not doing that with the prostate cancer patients. I'm, I'm not so sure if that's a that's an issue. But but that's one of those issues in health care, though. What do we reimburse and what do we not, you know? How much function are we going to pay for as a society for some of these kind of things. So it's definitely something we need to, need to think about and, and uh, decide what we need to do. Okay, radiation therapy. So we are um, sending energy through space or a material medium, and it, it causes ionization and excitation, and then that causes oxidation in the cells, and then they can die. But it actually breaks the bonds in the DNA and, and keeps the, the cells from being able to um, to reproduce, but it also can, can directly kill too. About 50% of cancer patients do get radiation therapy. It may be just the adjunctive, just to, to stack the odds in their favor. Um, and it is a localized treatment. You aim it directly at the tumor, and then um, you confine it just to that, that area. Except, there's one exception, and, and I, I don't want to... Um, some of y'all may be familiar with um, bone marrow transplants. Um, with last year, we had a student that static had a bone marrow transplant, but but um, sometimes they will do total body radiation um, before a bone marrow transplant just to kill all of the the capacity for to produce their own blood cells, and then they get the, the bone marrow transplant, and then it, um, it will engraft into the the transplanted um, cells engraft into the patient's bone marrow, and then they're, they're able to. Not, not grow their own abnormal ones anymore. They'll just grow the, the cells that were transplanted. So, so that's the only time that I know of that you that it would not be a localized treatment. But, but for our intents and purposes, it is a localized treatment. So just just go with that for a um, But the um, the modern equipment is so much better. There used to be a whole lot of scatter to other organs. Like if you you had a lung cancer. Um, that was being radiated, and, and a lot of lung cancers are sort of in the middle of the chest, in this high, um, high more area, um, or high more area, that's the thing. But um, that could cause scatter to the esophagus, and people could have real difficulty swallowing, so you would have to have eating tubes or something, because it could scatter so much to the esophagus, and they're doing a lot better job at that now, but sometimes it still happens. Um, and then you may, it, it may follow surgery to kill any cancer cells left behind. That was the adjunctive we talked about. And we, it can be palliative, just like surgery could, too, to relieve the symptoms of inoperable cancers. Um, and then to shrink the size of the tumor, pressing on organs and all that, to relieve pain or shortness of breath or, or difficulty swallowing, any of those kind of things. So that, that would be a palliative way. And that normal tissues really are usually able to recover um, better from radiation exposure than cancer cells can. They don't have as much, since they're not as functional, um, they're not as as, um, as well prepared to to um, to be able to recover from the, the radiation. So anyway, that's, that's, um, that's not always the case. We certainly do have normal cell damage as well. All right, and you, this is in your book now. Um, and I think you, you probably have seen this. You've got your alpha rays can be stopped by paper. Beta rays can be just stopped by our body. But then the gamma rays can go all the way through, through you and then be stopped by, by lead. So that just tells you the, the penetrating capacity. So which one you think is the best therapy for, for cancer? The gamma. The gamma, exactly. So that's really just to, to make that point. 
Okay. <clears throat> this is sort of an old picture, but they still do use one air accelerators. And then this is some really, really busy kind of slide here. And then we talk about exposures and how radiation is delivered to the tissue. Um, and you, anybody that's working in, in radiation care, in radiography, you have to wear a dosimeter just to count how much radiation that you have in a certain, certain period of time. Um, the dose is the amount of radiation that's absorbed by the tissue. And all this is on your notes page. But, um, it depends on how intense the exposure is and how long you're exposed and then how close the radiation source is to, to the cell. So, um, some of them die right away, others die from the impairment of the cell division. So it, can, it goes both ways. Um, others can repair the radiation damage and recover. Some cancer cells can recover from it and that's, that's not good. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes that's, that's what happens. So, and then normal cells can, can regenerate um, better than the cancer cells usually. Um, and not all cancer cells are identical, so different cells can respond differently to the radiation um, exposure. Fractionation means giving it rather than giving the dose all at one time. You do it over um, over a, a certain period of time, and it typically it's been like a Monday through Friday because clinics are just open Monday through Friday and they're not on open on the weekends in, in a lot of places. So so that's just kind of what it's been, and as a convenient sort of thing, you have five fractions a week and then, then rest over the weekend and then it, um, a lot of the regimens call for about six weeks of, of treatment if it's a adjunctive therapy like uh, somebody with breast cancer that, that might have a, a risk for recurrence. Uh, my mom had had her had a lumpectomy. Her, her breast cancer was right lower quadrant and she had a lumpectomy um, and then they got all the, um, they made sure the margins are clear, but they actually did remove some lymph nodes too. She had one little microscopic area and one lymph node, and so they were in the breast area and the underarm area. Um, and so that, that's the way that, that they do it. Sometimes in hers was a six week kind of treatment. Sometimes though, if it's a palliative treatment, they'll, they'll give, um, give it just over maybe five days. I'm not sure what they were going to do with Nathan's patients. They didn't, they didn't say how long she was going to do radiation, did they, Nathan? No, they didn't. So, uh, yesterday was the first treatment. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't know, you know how long that was going to be. Well, anyway, they used to, to call it RADS, the, the unit of, of um, dosage and everything, but now they go they go by gray. It's a GY instead of the RAD. 100 RADs equals one gray. So you could see it either way. Just and you don't have to memorize that necessarily. But when, if you hear those words, then uh, just know that that, uh, that a gray is bigger than a RAD. And so if you've got a, got a, a lot of grays. That's, that's a lot. Um, and there are different tissues in the body can tolerate different cumulative amounts of radiation. So um, if you had a radiation like two weeks ago, or something that is, has gotten in a steady disease and you're treating it to relieve the pain, you can only give so so much. You can give them a, a certain dose and then you may be able to give them another dose later on if they progress and they're having pain again, but you can't just go on forever and keep you know, doing it over and over again. And there is a certain, um, in every body tissue, there's a certain um, limit on how many rads or grays that they can, they can take over time. And um, it is, there are some tissues that, that don't respond well to radiation because you're killing more normal cells than abnormal, like in the liver, is, it happens like that sometimes. So it's not always the best kind of, kind of choice of therapy. So um, this linear accelerator is computerized. It's a computerized treatment plan. It takes them a long time to do the very first um, treatment planning. They, they map out where it needs to be. They, they map out where they're going to put bed blocks to, to prevent scatter to areas. <coughs> And, um, and it's, in, it's all in the computer, though, and that's, so it's going to be the same thing um, every time. That's why they need to hold still, and that's why when Nathan was gone so long with this patient yesterday, because she was she was very confused and was pulling at everything. I imagine you did you see her? Uh, no, well, we weren't in the room. Did you see her through the little window though and watch no, her at all? Window. But you knew she was. She well, was, I kept running back and forth because she would keep covering her face. With her. Oh gosh, and they have to hold still or they're going to get radiation where they don't want it. So that's really a toughie that's going to be still. So that's really, really tough to deal with. Okay. Um, so let's see, the client's in exactly the same position every single day. And that's not going to happen. That way, you have a break. And you do not, this, remember this, this is very important. When they make markings um, with the 
like a permanent deep pen, which is, you know, your skin's going to shed eventually, and it's not going to be all the way permanent. But, if, you know, if you mark yourself with a Sharpie, it'll take a while for it to, to wipe off. But um, if they make markings with a marker, then um, don't let them wipe, make sure and tell the patient don't wash it off, because then we'll have to do the mapping out all over again. And sometimes, too, though, they'll do tattoos, which are permanent, just dots, to mark some of the, the, the outer limits of the area. Um, but then they'll they'll have some some other other markings. Um, they're they're more more specific with um, with the with the marker that could be washed off if you scrub hard enough. So do not wash the markings off. Don't you don't wash them off and don't let them do it either. So okay. Um, and then um, this is called teletherapy because it's from a distance. You're you're giving it from a machine into the body. So that's why it's called teletherapy external beam radiation. So um, the, the source is outside of the patient, and the patient isn't radioactive. You're just sending the beam, just like that gamma radiation thing, you're sending the beam to that, that tumor. Um, and it's usually given the five days of the week and all that, over two to seven weeks. And then you teach the families, do not, do not um, uh, wash the radiation site, even if there's, there's um, not markings there, you just use um, plain water with no soap because it can really irritate the, the skin. And there's going to be more shedding of the skin, so it's like mom had a lot of darkening. It wasn't even like a tan exactly. You think it'd be so like a sun tan, but if it was, it was sort of just a grayish um, kind of discoloration. But it is really, really gets really, really dry. Um, but anyway, you don't apply deodorant or lotions or medications or anything. Um, uh, to that area, to do no perfume, no powders, except for things that, that the radiation oncologist has recommended. And my mom had an aloe-based uh, gel that she could put on. It was a water-soluble, and so, um, but but you need to make sure that the patient approved it with the, the radiation oncologist. Don't just put put uh, lotions on that that area um, for radiation. Um, and then don't don't uh, rub scratch or um, uh, scrub it. Um, don't um, don't apply a lot of heat or cold uh, because the, the the temperature sensation and everything is not gonna not gonna be the same when it's, when they're having that, that skin damage. Uh, inspect the skin for damage, of course. Wear loose, soft clothing so that it's not not irritating to the, the area. It's gonna be sensitive, especially toward the end and for the, the next several weeks after the the uh, radiation has finished. Sometimes you still see. Um, accumulation of, of effects on the skin that it worsen after it's finished up. And then you definitely protect the skin from sun exposure during treatment and from at least a year after the, the therapy is discontinued. Um, you use a new protective clothing. You know, once the radiation is discontinued, um, always um, you have to be radiated. And then you use sunblocking agents with at least um, SPF 15. And I think a lot of people are in there. Um, and then external beam poses no risk to other people for radiation exposure. Only risk to other people would be if they're in the room with the patient and they happen to get some scatter from the from the beam. So you're not they're not radioactive. Um, just the effects of the radiation having gone into their body is what kills the cancer. And then have them get plenty of rest and even eat a balanced diet. And if they're able to exercise, that's that's even better. If their hemoglobin's good enough. Um, to, to exercise some, it, it really does help with fatigue to have at least some exercise. It doesn't have to be a um, uh, uh, real, real intense exercise, but just, just walking or, or not just couch potato. You know. Okay, here's a picture of an immobilizer device that, that, um, that they can use to, to try to keep them in the, in the same position every day. Okay, Reiki therapy is internal radiation. The source goes into the patient and it, it has direct contact with the tumor tissue. Um, and the, the, the source can, um, can be a solid um, or sealed source. Um, or like the, that's, that's one where they have um, hollow needles that actually go all the way through the tumor. It really looks pretty awful. Um, it looks like these big, great big straws coming through, like the coils for the little prostate. And uh, then they, they um, insert the sort of radiation to the source to uh, the little, um, the, the solid um, little seeds in, um, and, and they actually do 
leave it in just a certain number of days and then, then take it out, but it has real contact just directly. That's, that's that localized therapy part. And they, they, yes, they are at radioactive because while it's in their body like that. And they, they do um, seeds for prostate cancer sometimes now where they, they just implant them in and then they, they just um, uh, have like, half like, half like, they just give them a certain length of time to where they're, um, where they're actually not, not around people. And then um, sometimes you'll we'll see prostate cancer patients or um, if you see a scan, they'll say that there's still those implanted seeds in there. They just don't go back in and then take them out. They just leave, leave them in. So that's, that's something that's a little new since I was actually in practice. Um, so, but anyway, um, the unsealed sources can be a liquid that you drink or the capsule that can be swallowed or um, that can be distributed to a targeted organ, especially the, the thyroid, because the thyroid, if, it, if it's a liquid that's iodine, that's going to go to the thyroid, and you just know that it is. Y'all have already talked about um, hyperthyroidism and that treatment with radioactive iodine. The dosage is different with um, chemotherapy, so you um, radiation therapy is a great so um, they definitely are radioactive, and it, it is usually a higher dose than what you do for, for, um, for hypothyroidism. And so the, the patient is radioactive and, um, until they get, um, like about three days afterwards. It sort of depends on the dosage, and they have to listen to what the doctor says. But it may, may be about three days that they, they shouldn't be around uh, pregnant women or children. If there's any potential that you'd be around pregnant women or children, you need to just stay away and stay home. And um, you definitely need to um, use a separate toilet. And some people, um, some folks recommend flushing the toilet several times after you go because the, the radiation will, will be in the um, excretions. So, um, okay, if the source is inge ingested, the unsealed, you do have to do the special disposal of your feces, the private bathroom, and stay away from pregnant women or young children. Okay, that's what I said. I just want to make sure I say the same thing I got on here. All right, <clears throat> make, make a big mark on this. Time and distance and shielding. That's something that you just always remember. Time, distance, and shielding. Um, and this is uh, for, the, for the test, and just always remember, because um, if you're ever in, in the... Um, a situation of exposure, um, you, you need to know this. I'll explain that when we talk about that. Um, that it works square law. Well, you know. But the nurse tries to be um, plan the care um, to be as, as efficient as possible, as little time in the room as possible, um, stay as far away from the patient from the radiation source as possible, and, as, and as, um, as much time as possible behind a lid shield. If you're just having to talk to them or asking what they want for lunch or something like that or delivering their lunch tray, you, you can stay behind the shield as, as much as possible. They keep that in their in their room if they were in the hospital. So um, as I had I took care of some patients on our floor, we'd be at the very end of the hall so that, that nobody else would be passing by. And uh, so that, that was the, the best way to do it, have as far away from the nursing station as possible for the other patients. Um, so they have a private room. Um, Visits are limited to 10 to 30 minutes, and visitors have to sit at least six feet away from the line. And that's on the sheet here. Um, and I'll let y'all um, read through those six things that I've got, got listed as precautions, because I'd love to read that. I'm not going to try and get that to you. But, but um, it does make um, make sense to uh, dispose of the um, excreted materials in special containers or in a toilet not used by others and, and all that, if, if it's needed for that, that type of therapy. Um, and let's see here, the safety principles for the, the radiation, the distance, you want to um, maintain the greatest distance possible, um, spend as little time, shield yourself as, as much as possible. If you're pregnant or could be pregnant, avoid contact with the, um, the radiation source at all, and you don't want to be taking care of that patient at all. Um, you have to make sure you let your supervisor know if you're assigned to something like that. Um, and then wear a monitoring device with a, a dosimeter so you see how much radiation you've been exposed to. Um, keep clients with the implanted radioisotopes in a private room with a private bath um, and as far away from other, other hospital patients as possible. 
dispose of the body fluids of the clients with the, the unsealed implants would be like the, the liquids if they had a capsule or if they, they swallowed the radioactive iodine. Um, and um, they put specially uh, marked containers um, uh, if they um, with their, from their body fluids and everything if they are <coughs> when they're at home they when you do radioactive iodine therapy they're probably going to go home and just do the, the flushing and do the don't you hate that thinking about that going into your sewage system and then it goes into your water treatment plant and think, oh, I'll just go like the meditation system. We talk about them and we've got all these narcotics in our water. <coughs> and this, the one that's for the sealed sources, <coughs> um, the hand handled bed linen and the clothing with care and according to agency protocol, well, you really should, I guess, with the, uh, especially if somebody's incontinent, you would have to do that even if it was unsealed. But but uh, you need to be, be careful. And when you do change, change the bed, um, make sure that there's not any, anything that's, that's dropped out, like if something, you know, some of the seeds came out or the needles or something like that. So look real closely to make sure that nothing has, has dislodged. And then use long handled forceps to place any dislodged implants into a lid container. They always have that in the room if, if you've got a patient with those um, sealed sources of oil seeds. Um, and then, um, Make sure that you talk to the radiation department if there's a little kid problem. And there's a chart in 2401 and maybe it's really good to yeah. Okay, here's our inverse square law. And you need to know this, but we're not, I'm not going to test on it until 2018, so don't really worry about this now. It's just that the further away from the source is, it, it's a, um, it's, a, it's squared at this, if at, at one meter versus two meters, it's um, you do like if you're one foot further away, then then it's a fourth of the exposure. You do one over two squared, and you do one over three squared. You'd have one ninth of exposure at three meters versus the one meter, and you you'll have so four times four, one and sixteenth of exposure. And that's that's really important because like even if you're if you're on the highway and there's some truck that's wrecked that had a radiation source, you know they have a, a radiation warning marker on the truck and, and you're trying to help somebody get out of the burning truck or whatever, um, you, you need to make sure where somebody's outside of it, that they're close to the source, you can get them away. It's probably go away if you're able to. As far, even if you can move one foot further away from the source, or you can be just one foot away from the source, that's still, you know, uh, that'll make a lot of difference in how much radiation is that. So the distance is a tremendous, um, deal. So, you know, that it's possible we can you know in the hospital there's radiation sources in the hospital. If there's some sort of breach or leak in the hospital, you need to know that, that you need to be as far away from as possible, of course, as, and spend as little time as possible. And if you can have shielding, of course, if you're out on the highway, you're not going to have much shielding, but the, your, your best um, friend is going to be in distance if, if you're out in that remote area or something. But so if you don't have to memorize that at this particular point, but you want to know it. All right. Um, let's do, let's do, um, 10 minutes and then we'll start. Or you just don't want to eat, right? Want to eat. Don't, don't want to eat. Yeah. So you want to watch, see if they're losing weight. Um, it's not always going to happen with weight twice weekly. That's somebody's standard. And, but that's an idea that, you know, if you, if you can, if they're in the hospital, you want to weigh twice weekly at least. But, um, and then this is a little bit different, but... Um, small, frequent, high-protein, high-calorie meals for the people that are anorexic. Um, and you, you, don't, you don't want them to have wasted calories, but again, it's better than, than nothing. So, and you may want to do supplements, but you want to try to do the, the meals and, and not have them eat too much at one time because if they, they may just get so full that they, they fear eating or they're afraid they're going to feel bad if they eat. So they, you want them to eat small amounts more often, and that's, that's one of the, the deals on there. Um, and I do have, have um, on the, I'm not going to go over all that notes page because you can read that. Um, this, this is the, the most important thing about the, the small frequent meals and, and all. But then I've already told you about the more two the bigger gets. And this yeah. um, part on the notes page that it had, it's from the Defense <coughs> and it's actually on the um, NCI website. It used to be a, a big booklet that you could give to people. Maybe if they still have hard copies, but they do. It's online. It's really, really a good resource. So, so look at that, those kinds of things that um, if they got a dry mouth and all that, to, to uh, rinse the mouth out before eating if they got a bad taste in their mouth. Okay. 
this, these are, some of these things are um, effects of radiation and chemotherapy and maybe some other mm -hmm. kinds of therapies. And anorexia is one of those that could be from any therapy. It's, you know, the, it's some, some medications are worse than others in those categories, but we're just going to be general today. This is specifically radiation, and that's dry desquamation. Um, and there is a chart about skin protection um, during radiation therapy in chart 24-2 and so I'll let you refer to that. And this one's the first wet desquamation. It can really get if we did and um, that's sometimes they will well they definitely would give a break from therapy until that healed <coughs> up some and maybe put the aloe uh, gel on it. Of course, at the direction of the radiation therapist. All right, and then this with skin reactions, use non-irritating lotion or solution that contains no metal, alcohol, perfume, or additives, and don't make that judgment yourself. Though again, consult with a replacement radiation therapist. I want some to do. Um, no petroleum-based products at all. It has to be water soluble. And we want to try to prevent infection and facilitate the healing, and just like we would with any tissue integrity issue. Um, no constricted garments, you want to, to wash clothes in the least irritating, you know, something like ivory snow or something like that that you can wash for, for the babies and, and don't have deodorant on the, any of those areas. Okay, and you can have skin problems with chemotherapy too. Some, some can actually cause cracking, they, they have a hand foot syndrome that you get cracking of the bottom of your feet or the palms of your hands and it can actually peel like, like a snake. Kind of. That's, that's really, that can happen with some of the targeted therapies as well. I mean, rashes can happen with some of the targeted therapies. So the dry skin you want to, um, to lubricate with the non-irritating and all that, just like it says, whether it's from chemo or radiation or targeted or whatever. And, um, and sometimes they may have to end up going to a dermatologist if the, if the rash is a problem or change the therapy. All right, fatigue and, and her hesitation to identify when they feel the best so that they can plan activities. Um, prioritization is a big, big thing. What, what's the most important thing for you to spend time on? Um, try to rest before and after activities, but it's probably better not to take like three hour naps. It's better to, to take some short power naps uh, more frequently. Um, that, that's really, that may not be the best for every single person, but the research that they've done so far shows that, that um, you know, short power naps more frequently and resting before, especially if you've got a, a real chronic fatigue going on with your, um, especially like at the end of radiation therapy or during chemotherapy. Therapy. therapy. Um, get assistance with your activities if you need it. Um, try to, to say well nourished and, and the big thing too that they're doing and lots of that. <coughs> Breast cancer research money is just a lot bigger than any other cancer money, so we've got a lot more data on breast cancer. But um, people that are exercising during their therapy, even if they're tired, that helps them to, to have more energy. Unless, like if they're very anemic, that's not going to, to be the best for them to, to exercise so much. But they need to get up and move some. If they're really, really anemic, they need to consult with the doctor and see if they can get some, some sort of treatment for that. If it's an iron supplement, so whatever it is, it's causing the anemia. Um, maybe you want to Maybe you want to if the if the young if they're not really anemic, um, they, they need to be doing something to you that know, graduates and then my wife says that um, you work up to moderate exercise, especially walking, um, for all types of cancer patients. It, it can be beneficial even if they were sedentary before they started their therapy. They can they can start it during the, the therapy to, to try to make it it might make them sleep better during the night by, by having a little exercise too. All right, oral and oropharynx and esophageal reactions. You can have that with chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Um, I think they're, they're in mostly talking about radiation here, but the, the interventions and all are pretty much the same. If you want to do uh, the dental work before the initiation of radiation therapy to the head or neck, it, it doesn't really matter in other places. If you've got a head and neck cancer and you're being radiated, then that's, that's when you're going to have the dental work done. It wouldn't be on the radiator hip. You will not have to do the dental work done. That's, that's just for, for that local area. But now chemotherapy goes off of the body, and, and some chemotherapies can, can cause mouth sores and all, and, and problems with the teeth. So if they can possibly get any um, 
like fillings done or extractions done before they start their chemotherapy, that's ideal. That doesn't always happen, of course, but that, that would be the ideal. Zero stomia, that XER word on your notes page, um, means John now. So I don't know why we have to say it's such a hard way, but that's, that's what that means. Um, but it can lead to, to people um, having other things that taste really bad, um, metallic taste or aftertaste. And some, some people even have to, to eat with plastic um, um, flatware or whatever. What's that plastic silverware? It's not, it's not plastic and silver at the same time, but you know. The, the stuff you, you eat with, the implements that you eat with can be plastic or what you eat it out of needs to be something besides metal because sometimes that, that just intensifies the metallic taste in the mouth. Um, and um, the, it can, the dry mouth can make, make the mouth more susceptible to injury and it can make you have more tooth decay because your saliva actually protects you um, against some of the, the bacteria that can you know, destroy your, your teeth and your texture bones. And then there is a mouth care um, chart in any um, chart 24 9. It gives you a lot more information about um, taking care of the exercise. But um, they, it says to use peroxide and, um, and water for peroxide and saline. I, I still don't like peroxide. But, you know, that's, that's one of those that we, we found with, uh, with trait care or what that, that, that um, evidently a lot of places, because some of your videos use peroxide in the trait care, didn't they? But, but we don't use it, and, and Rowan and and, um, and, um, and Northeast don't don't use it for trick here either. So um, we, we did not recommend uh, peroxide unless somebody had like a real coated tongue. Um, if they have open areas, we, did, we would not use peroxide at all because, because peroxide, peroxide does what to raw tissue? It, just, it gets rid of the protein, doesn't it? It gets rid of the, the granulation tissue that's trying to, to come into a wound or into your raw mouth or whatever, and it can just sort of wash away. So I'm not, I'm not wild about the peroxide part, but you see it in, in some, some places do it. Okay, so salt water or baking soda rinses are the best, and I have a, a void peroxide on my notes page. Um, and then you've got, you need to do about a fourth of a teaspoon to a, a half a cup of water. That's close to isotonic, the, the concentration that salt would be in the blood. Uh, but you can use salt or soda or a combination, whatever, whatever, whatever uh, will work. But it, it is not going to burn. Like, you would think putting salt in a wound would burn if you've got a raw mouth. But if you dilute it like this, it will be just like if you, you had a little um, vial of normal soda. <coughs> and sometimes people will just just get bottles of, of normal saline and use that if they can afford it. But if they can't, you can make it yourself this way. You can actually boil your water in the in the microwave and you know, and, and, you know with the added salt to make it so then that way it would sterilize it so it wouldn't have to be so expensive. And you can have lot of pain sprays that would put on with the pain. Um, one of the, I don't know if we talked about this here at all before, is the carafate. I have a human, I have not seen that pretty long recently, but Carafate is an anti-ulcer, and it actually adheres to the protein, to the raw areas, so um, it, it really can, um, can, if you can take it like a board, a meal time, in the liquid form, um, it can actually adhere to, to the, and they swish around in the mouth first for, for a few seconds or something, and then, then swallow it if they've got esophagitis or sore throat or esophagitis of raw areas anywhere from the, the mouth down to the stomach. Then it can adhere to those raw areas, and then, it, then it's more comfortable to eat and drink. But you need to let them wait like half an hour after that. And don't chase it with any water. You know, do that the last thing. Um, if you take another pills or something, um, they can take it during the liquid with water it can actually cause some pulmonary fibrosis um, where you just actually have strands of fibrous tissue. So you're not going to be having much um, perfusion or the most any of the um, oxygen exchange in, in those fibrous areas. Um, but you can have it from radiation and some chemotherapy drugs 
will do it too. They're not most of them don't do it, but there are some specific ones that will. Um, and especially with cumulative doses, there's one called bleomycin that, that can definitely cause pulmonary effects. Um, and uh, you can use uh, bronchodilators, you can use expectorants and cause suppressants and bed rest and oxygen and all that if the per perfusion isn't good, especially their, their pulse ox. Um, then you might see fibrosis on the chest x-ray. Sometimes if it's an acute phase, they'll use steroids like you would with an exacerbation of COPD um, and then taper it back down. And, and um, sometimes it will, it will improve, but sometimes it can be a cumulative thing that will be chronic like what COPD is. And so impaired gas exchange can be a um, initial diagnosis that the, um, that the pH is, is abnormal or you've got um, low pulse boxes. Okay. No, this is a, this is a GI effects. Um, we want to, the, the most important thing I've got on here is when you know that, that um, like if you're given radiation somewhere near the stomach or the intestines, you may want to give uh, preventive antiemetics. And there are lots and lots of chemo drugs that we know are, they call it highly emetogenic, meaning that it's more likely to cause emesis or vomiting. So we want to we want to do this preventively rather than letting them get sick, get real sick, and then then they have anticipatory nausea. So every time they see the the building that they're getting the radiation or the chemotherapy in, they're going to throw up. I mean that that's really that that's very 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 real. And I had I think I'm, I don't know if I told you this last semester or not, but I had this this man that took treatment for Hodgkin's disease, and it's really really tough from you know with nausea and vomiting. And I was talking to the, this man's wife, his patient's wife, and then I, he, he happened to see me. He was in a different part of the store, the grocery store, and he, he, um, he saw me and, and, and went outside. I didn't know at that point. I just saw him walk away, and his wife told me later that he had gone outside and thrown up after he saw me. <laughs> you know, and that, that's just that's anticipatory nausea, and, and we want to try to catch it and, and um, keep it from happening if we can at all, make that at all possible. We've got much, much better drugs than we used to. So we need to watch for dehydration and alkalosis, um, check IMO, and have a non-irritating diet. That's kind of variable from person to person, but if they have diarrhea, we have to, to deal with that too. There are a lot of chemo, and, and of course radiation if you're radiating here, the, the GI tract is kind of on diarrhea from that. Um, and sometimes you can have urinary problems too, but you can get your bladder irritation if they mm. spike your bladder from, from some pulmonary radiation. So anyway, the, 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 the preventive aspect is what we want to deal with. And remember, I think I told you that I want you to look up um, Zofran or the Humdansetron. I, I don't remember which source I told you. I think I told you that from, through the pharmacology book, but I think I've got it listed somewhere else too. But on um, Dancitron is going to be our prototype chemotherapy, or chemotherapy and radiation, um, nausea relief medicine. And y'all have probably seen that listed on your patient's chart that you can throw on post-op nausea, too, or, or, or another type of issue. So this, it's a real commonly used drug, so I figure that's a good prototype drug to have y'all to, to know. It's a 5-HT3. There, there's a serotonin. Um, can actually send a message from the through the vagus nerve to the the vomiting center. The chemoreceptor triggers on in the brain that, that makes that encourages sickness. We always think of serotonin as being a feel good hormone. Well, it is in the brain, but it's not necessarily it travels up the vagus nerve from the stomach to the vomiting center. So, but we're really blocking the serotonin in the gut if we do that. Okay, and then reproductive. We always have to talk about sex. And we have to about that. <laughs> I always have to have my, my pictures and all this here. Um, I was going to just get a young couple, and I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I've, I've said this before, but there's more more older people having they're, they're having a, a greater increase in in um, incidence of an STDs in older people. That's the biggest growing population of STDs. So it's it is a it is a big deal when uh, if they have neuropathy with some chemo drugs you can have neuropathy and and um, you know erections 
require nerve, intact nerve function. And so if you have a, a neuropathy problem, um, then that, that can be, that could make people lose the capacity to, to have sex. So that, that can, could be, and then older people you know, have, have some issues with that a lot anyway. So, so that can be a big loss. It can be a tremendous, tremendous loss. And the, the next down from that, I think, is if you have to take the car keys away. <laughs> Impotence and car, car keys, you know, the, are the, the two, the worst that I've ever seen, you know, as far as bothering mm -hmm. men anyway, you know. So, but uh, but women, they're, they're, women have, are bothered by, by it too, like vaginal dryness and things like that, and we're paying with intercourse, so we, we need to deal with that. With it's very real and very important to people. We don't want to um, miss that kind of assessment. That can really affect their their quality of life. So. So it's not just our young people. So, um, but if the the issue with reproduction, though, the um, I hate to say the Lance Armstrong Foundation. I don't even call it that now. It's just called this one. But um, that's there. That was there used to be. What was it called? Fertile Hope, I think, is a, a agency, but they, they merged with the Good Strong organization, and there's a lot of information on, um, you know, like, like saving some, some eggs and, um, and sperm banking and all, so that if, if people want to have kids after they've had chemotherapy, um, then, then uh, that's, that's the place to, to refer them to. Okay, there's lots more effects here, y'all, but, gosh, just barely touched this thing. Okay, I want I want to go just back up a little bit with this. I told you I would mention this thing about the the cell cycle and all that. And y'all y'all probably have this this sheet. Um, well, make, if you printed it out, you don't have to print it out, but it's it's posted online. And we've got this thing about the about the cell cycle um, as well. And that you have that in your book. It's really a lot better picture. This is a picture. The cell cycle thing um, was from my pre, my preceptor from. Um, when I worked, when I was getting my master's, and she she taught a class in an oncology course that I was taking, and um, and so that she she had, gave that as a handout, and I think it's it's so much more simple than some of the others, and I think it really it's it's very um, very helpful. You don't have to memorize it or anything, but realize that there are cell cycle issues with the chemotherapy. We'll talk about that a little more. But um, I just wanted to mention with the. Um, is the side effects. I have some chemotherapy and radiation therapy side effects listed on here that I may not have, have covered as thoroughly in these slides, but read, just read over those just so you can kind of see the comprehensive body systems that can be affected. So that's why I wanted to mention that at this particular point, because that, that will give you some more. And it, it's in your book too, but it's real long and drawn out in, in your book. This may be your better summary just to, just to have a um, idea of know what's on the slides and then sort of just look at some of, some of the other things that could happen to your patients. Okay, clinical trials. This is just, this is more of an FYI thing. I'm not going to question you this on the test, but since we're talking about evidence-based practice and all that, it's just, if you're talking about a phase one trial, then that just tells what the dosage was, the, the highest tolerated dose or whatever and then uh, identify side effects in phase two. You're trying to see if it works and see if it's safe um, in the long term. And then phase three is when you compare it with the standard therapy. So um, the thing I do want you to know on this notes page, I don't know why they put it on the slide, but the, e the ECOG scale um, and for performance status. I mentioned the Karnofsky scale, so you may see that sometimes the zero is 100. But don't, don't worry about memorizing that, but you just may see that at some point that this ECOG, Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group Scale, I do want you to know that the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 means, because it does go up from 0 means you have no symptoms and you're fully active, and then 5 means you're not, you know, pretty, pretty much not compatible with life. It's like the Karnofsky goes kind of the other direction. The 100% means you are, are fine, and then the 0 means you're dead. So, um, so but, but do, do know that um, you know what the zero, one, two, three, four, five means because it, it really does does make sense. But so, uh, the zero means means you're good, and five means means you're not as not good as possible. All right. So uh, we want to reduce the number of cancer cells in the tumor site with chemotherapy. Um, cancer cells can escape death by staying in the GO, that that resting phase. They can go into a resting phase, and then then they can come out of it. When um, they see that the other cells are dying, they can come out of it and start reducing the So, um, 
we need to, uh, we have um, drug resistant resting in non cycling cells, so that can be a problem. Chemotherapy is a systemic therapy, and it's, um, okay, you, you, can, you can deal with the tumor itself with chemotherapy, but you can also deal with any remote sites where it may be trying to go, where they may have escaped. You remember when we saw the blood supply and escaped cells going to organs and everything? That's where we, we can get hopefully get all of those. So we can do, again, cure palliation or, or, or prophylaxis. Sometimes with prophylaxis, it's not, not as standard. It's more, um, um, it's, it's more theoretical and, and experimental, but sometimes people will take some like tamoxifen or something if they're at a high risk and then it may for, for breast cancer or something like that. Okay, and this is what I have um, on this particular notes page. It tells what, the, what drugs that I want you to know. Um, nitrogen mustard, which is a, an alkylating agent, um, and I do want you to, to know, know that, but that cytoxin is actually um, like another generation of a nitrogen mustard kind of alkylating agent. It's not quite as, as toxic. It's not, uh, nitrogen mustard is a vesicant, actually. If you, if you read the, the part in your book, you've seen the the, uh, the extravasation and it just while well, you can see all the tendons and everything just stick it out it's really gross it's like a horrible horrible bed sore or, or it almost looks like a charred burn sometimes it really is a chemical burn is what happens so, but now it's a toxin and pure so it's, it's, it's more it's better tolerated and the one thing that that's weird about the toxin it definitely does call, cause um, lower in white blood cell counts <laughs> Um, but it also can cause uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. That should be in your in, 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 um, um, in the pharmacology. Yeah. But hemorrhagic cystitis is the kind of weird side effect. Mm -hmm. The bladder is very, very sensitive to, to um, the cytosis going through the system. Um, so, so certainly um, pay attention to that. Interferon is a biologic therapy that I want you to know about. And the big thing to know about that is that it, it is a... Um, uh, an immune kind of thing. It helps to uh, increase the body's immune response against the cancer cells, but it can also make you feel like you got the flu because that's what, what your body does, and then you feel bad from from an infection, um, your fever and all that, because of what your immune system is doing to try to fight it. And so that's, that's the way you're going to see the blue-like symptoms, just feeling achy, feeling bad, you can have fever, um, possibly chills, and all that. Okay, and then tamoxifen, that, it's on that, that sheet that I gave you too. Tamoxifen is a hormonal agent that's, that um, mainly what, what hormonal agents do is they, they change the, the extracellular environment to suppress the cancer cell division and allow for the regression of the tumor. <laughs> but this one in particular is, um, it, it blocks estrogen receptors, and you need to know that about it. It, it, is, it blocks the extra estrogen receptors so that the estrogen can get into the cells and allow them to have that good information. And um, so with hormonal agents, what's a, what's a high risk factor for any hormonal agent? Birth control pills or whatever? DVT, exactly. So just be aware of that, that any hormonal agent for prostate cancer or breast cancer or whatever can increase the risk of DVTs. We have patients that would be on long road trips and, and show up with their, um, when they got home or, eat, or along their trip, with a, with a DVT and have to go in the hospital for a while or whatever, or on airplane trips. You can't really, they tell you to do exercises on airplane. Well, if they make you sit in your seat for turbulence and stuff, you can't move properly at all. I mean, it's really, it's very high risk. So um, that's something that you probably need to talk to the doctor about before they take it on the road trip. But what I do is I know that I'm going to be able to do on this because I do want to push some prophylaxis with aspirin. And the other one is, is uh, Perceptin, the uh, Trastuzumab, MAB, is monoclonal antibody when you see MAB at the end. It means that it's, it's targeting something. So it, is a, like, it was one of the first targeted therapies that came out. And uh, this, this is where I wanted you to really look at this sheet. Um, you, can, you can see the, the HER2 gene amplification. Everybody has HER2, but it's human epidermal, epidermal growth factor receptor 2 is what that stands for. So they call it HER2. And um, in the, this picture, you're supposed to have just like one squiggle, but in some breast cancers, there are a whole bunch of squiggles here. 
you're, it's, mm -hmm. it's over producing that, that, that particular protein that's, that's on the surface of the cell. You're supposed to have some of it, but you're not supposed to have that many copies of it. And that's, a, that's an abnormality that, that you see um, in about uh, 25 to 30 percent of breast cancers, and it, may, it is a poor prognostic factor. Um, and so that means their, their, their prognosis would be, be more poor. Um, if they have the HER2 positive, but they do have the target, this targeted therapy for it now. So, so sometimes people that, that um, used to be higher risk or can be lower risk um, because there is some of the immunity because of the, um, the HER2. So um, anyway, it does give them, give them that option and it turns off the overexpression of the gene that's causing the immune control So So that's your prototype targeted therapy. Okay, I just got this out of the um, magazine or something, a uh, um, journal that I, that I had. But this was a mustard gas from. Um, this was a this was a war thing. This this was a, um, a chemical chemical warfare kind of thing, and um, it says it smells like smells like garlic, um, horseradish, mustard, strong vesicant. They even used that vesicant because it was it was causing people's skin to peel off when they were exposed to it, and they. Where the, the gas, or of course, their the, your respiratory tract. If you breathed it in, it would do you know mess up your respiratory tract as, as well. So that's they knew that it killed cells, and then some scientists figured out that uh, well maybe it'll kill cancer cells for us if it'll if it's actually causing problems with cells. Again. So, um, but um, nitrogen mustard was the first um, chemotherapy drug approved by the FDA, and um, and it was in World War One actually. In, Chemotherapy and radiation therapy together. That's what's on the, your notes page here. Um, and, and head and neck cancer sometimes as, as well. They see the radiation and the chemotherapy used at the same um, at the same time instead of in sequence. All right. Um, I had posted under the, the lab information when we were doing uh, central line dressings. It, it had some. Um, some central lines, lots, lots of different central lines. I'm not going to pull that up now because y'all can go look back and look at it again. Um, but that's that's really the preferred method, you can get, especially a vesicant drug. But, um, but a lot of people use um, lines or cuts for, for, um, for all kinds of therapy. Now is a, a safer route. It's not 100% not guaranteed. They still can have problems or splits in the orbiter or something like that or infections and all. But, but the, the uh, central line is really the preferred way to give it intravenously. But you can see all those different different ways. Intracavitary would be like the putting the chemo in through a, a catheter into an abdominal cavity. Um, intrathecal is into the cerebrospinal fluid. You can do it through a lumbar puncture or spinal tap, or you can insert like a little porta cap into the ventricle of the brain. It's called an Omaya reservoir. reservoir. You can remember that. But there is a, like a little porta cap in the, the, the doctor does that. You know, it's not, you know, you put something in the brain. You can actually do it as an artery. They do have these pumps that if a colon cancer patient has has um, hepatic metastasis and so has the liver lesions, then you can um, pump it directly in, um, sort of like a like an insulin pump would be. That, but it goes in. It actually goes into that artery and it takes it right into the liver, so it will be more local therapy. You have fewer systemic side effects. Of course, you can do it with these topical creams or some of that. Which you can um, and let's see. Okay, and, and then on the first page, the, the next page it says the easiest way to to describe how cytotoxic therapy works is it damages DNA in some way. Well, we already talked about that that there is some problem with the DNA or with the genes. There's a, a problem with genes that causes the cancer in the first place, and so so we're trying to damage the DNA of the abnormal cells either directly causing the cell death or interfering with cell division. And that's, we already talked about that. 
cells that are dividing are much more sensitive to cytotoxic effects of chemotherapy. So that, that's the thing. That's where you're going to find your side effects. Your blood cells um, and your, uh, your skin cells and your skin cells and your skin cells. Okay, you know, your new you know, skin cells are going to have problems too. And your GI tract hair, reproductive cells. Um, and then you know, when if somebody is, um, is diagnosed with a, a cancer that needs chemotherapy pretty desperately, um, and they're, they're finding out that they're pregnant, that's a real big ethical thing. We can have some. We have two different women I can remember that um, that were pregnant when they found out, or they found out they were pregnant, you know, like right after they were diagnosed, and they they had Hodgkin's disease, which is highly curable even in stage four, but you're you're more likely to have have a good outcome if you go ahead and you get your treatment right away, is, you know, before it has time to progress. Well, one one woman chose to go on and have an abortion um, because she, you know, was, was just afraid that things would have. And then another one decided to, to just wait until after the baby was born. And so um, I, they both got along really well, but you just don't know. That's a really, really tough decision. It's, it's, that's a horrible thing to have to have to go through. Okay, this picture's not as bad as the one in your book. I thought this was worse, but that's the, the injury from the best of the drug. Um, and uh, it, I mean, like it says, like the chemical burn, and the best thing we need to do is to prevent it. So. Um, and the central lungs, or I've already mentioned that, and um, the peripheral vessels are unwise to use for continuous infusions of any type of chemotherapy. They do have, most of, most chemotherapy is intermittent, but um, when you, like, maybe over an hour or several hours or whatever, but there are some that are, that are in continuous infusion, and so it's better to have a, a central line for a continuous infusion for sure, because um, you can't watch it all the time to, um, to make sure that it hasn't, hasn't leaked out. Um, okay. Next on normal tissue, I'll let y'all kind of look over that. And one of the things we haven't mentioned is alopecia, which is what? Hair loss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, with the hair loss, it usually takes 10 days to two weeks for the first hair to come out. And um, I've had some some patients that kind of would say it in a funny way. I'm sure it's devastating when it first happens. But this one guy said that he had gone into his, his shop, his workshop, and it was in this garage, and his two sons were, were doing some carpentry work, and, and they had this, this high-velocity fan going, and he just happened to walk by the fan, and his hair just blew off. Oh, it just, every, every, <laughs> just, or a huge amount, just, whoosh, it was just gone. And this other lady told me that, that she went outside after supper to sit on her swing, and this, this kind of gust of wind came out, and it just, she just washed her hair just right off. And, and, and she's mm -hmm. flattered. Mm -hmm. This is another very bad state. Thank you. They can't have their hair. They think they're going to They just will not do it. And, and they, they really can jeopardize their, the, the chance for successful treatment um, if the if some of the things, the, the chemotherapy that causes alopecia is the best um, to use for that particular disease. But sometimes people can make that choice because they really, really cannot stand the idea of losing their hair. It's really, really important to people. So, and I know we want to be judgmental about it. Well, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. If we were all, if it really, I would do that. But we, we can't. We can't do it. We have to go with the best information that we know and, and accept their decision. I mean, even if we don't like it. So, okay. And I'm going to talk about bone marrow transplants in the 11 AD because it, it, we use it more for uh, leukemia, and uh, we'll talk about that. Um, I have low bacterial diet is indicated whenever the neutrophil count is less than 1,000. Um, and that's starting to be controversial, though. There are really some studies that they're, they're doing are saying it really doesn't make much difference whether you eat salads and raw fruit and, and have flowers in the room and all that kind of stuff. Um, but but a, a lot of places are still doing protective isolation when people have, have low, low, low blood cell counts, especially the neutrophil count. Um, if it's going to low, it depends on the facility and then all that. But, um, this is wonderful, wonderful um, stuff at the, at the very bottom um, of the, the notes page about the chicken expiration date on your, your foods and all that sort of thing. 
Um, and there's a lot, I've got on that notes page some um, charts. Did I, I did get it on your notes page about the chart 24-4, 24-5. I did get that in there, right? Yes. So I just wrote it in on mine so I wouldn't have to, to uh, copy it again. All right. <clears throat> um, this is one of the things you do need to know, too, is that why do we use combination here? It's because they are synergistic. What does that mean? They work together. So that's where the cell cycle comes in. There's some some chemotherapy drugs are cell cycle specific. They only act in, in um, like the mitosis phase. Um, and then some are non-specific, like the alkylating agents, the cytoxins, like the phosphamide and nitrate mustard are non-cell cycle specific. Um, in the synthesis phase, um, like uh, 5-fluorouracil and methotrexate and, and that particular one. You don't have to know that, but just know that they're, that you, you do look at the different phases of the cell cycle that they work in. If it doesn't catch it in one, one phase, then maybe you'll catch it in the mitosis phase and combine the, the medications that work to kill that, those kinds of cancer cells. Um, and then you, you want a combination that has different toxic side effects. In particular, when you talk about nadir, I want you to know that word is on the slide, nadir, and they do not are, it's on that, the, the second thing on the, on the right side. But that's the lowest level of the peripheral blood cell count, the white blood cell count, secondary to the bone marrow depression at, at different time intervals. So what we want to do is, if the nadir for cytoxin is like 10 days, and the nadir for another drug is, is um, you know, 21 days, that, that will keep the patient from just having a, a, a rock bottom drop um, to where it's, it's so toxic that, that they have no overwhelming infection and, and that they could die from it. So, so we want the synergism and we want the, the, uh, the side effects to be, be different. And you don't want several drugs that cause neuropathy. You don't want several drugs that cause a lot of skin issues. You don't want several drugs that all at the same time that then uh, cause a lot of nausea and vomiting. So you want to do a combination that's not going to, to additively um, increase the, the severity of, of any one kind of side effect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. And I did already talk to you about the, the interferon. And so that, the blue-like syndrome, I don't even know how much you know, but, but um, go, go through that. And the big thing, as far as intervention, I have at the bottom of the, of the page is that um, the pre-medicate and monitor and rest and assist. You can give Tylenol um, before the, the treatment and about every four hours after treatment to, to decrease like fever and and um, and the achiness and, and uh, it, it does make people feel a lot better. And, and a lot of y'all that have kids, you probably pre-medicate it for for uh, immunizations. I mean, do they still let you do Tylenol before immunizations? And it really makes a difference. If you don't, when you forget, don't do it, you're kind of sorry. <laughs> so, um, so premedicate and monitor the patient. And the monitoring things are kind of, the, I have a right run that. And then rest and assist. And um, in, in the worst case scenario with a biologic therapy, you can have rigors or rigors where it's just really hard shake and chills. And it, it can be, it can put a lot of stress on somebody's heart if they already have pre-existing um, coronary problems or um, cardiovascular problems. And we had, we've had the sense of people at the hospital when they were getting, mm -hmm. getting some um, uh, biologic therapy before, but because we were so worried about their, their pulse rate and their, their breathing and everything. And I remember I said in the MAB, with the yeah, trans, trans, trans 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 it's with the perceptions of generic agents, and now that's a monoclonal animal, and we're inviting the specific target cell. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're saying, that HER2 that's, that's um, being produced in greater quantities than it's supposed to be, that's what, what HER, the perceptin, is targeting. So that's a monoclonal antibody type thing. And um, you can actually actually have some infusion related um, and anaphylaxic, anaphylactic reactions. Seems like that. It, it didn't, didn't really say this, but but um, we've seen a lot of patients that you can tell that they're, they're starting to have a reaction if they start having a short breath on them and they can feel like they have this pain going from their, from their chest to their back. It's really just a sudden pain and they just go to their chair. And that, that can be, that can be a sign of their having a 64. Okay. We're going to, 
Let's I think um, I'm going to let you get on that activity. But you can read about these hematopoietic growth factors because they, they uh, the colony stimulating factors, we're, we're trying to stimulate, we, like we talked about the erythropoids, and then we've got the, the um, uh, neupogen, the granulocyte um, colony stimulating factor. And, um, Here we, we've already talked about the retoism somewhat. Mm -hmm. I have got this about how to calculate um, absolute neutral count. Just, just know what it is that you're not going to be responsible for the math. Mm -hmm. And I'll give it to you back and you can see that maybe we did part of the math too. So uh, we got, got a whole lot of other stuff to deal with now. So just be, just read it for now. And, 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 We'll, we'll come back to it. But um, Darbopoetin is a newer version of, of the procreator epigen. It's just a longer acting. It has a longer half-life. Um, and it can increase the risk of, um, um, of cardiovascular problems and that sort of thing. So, and this one, new manga, if you're, if you're increasing platelet production, what might be your side effect? And there are some charts in even 24-6 and 24-7 talking about preventing injury and bleeding and chromocytopenia and risk of that. Um, and that, that is, this is something that you can, you can read too. And we can give platelet transfusion, so you really do more platelet transfusion than using this. We stopped using it because of the problems with the with the DVDs. Okay, um, I'm going to let y'all just read through this plan thing. So this is like nursing process stuff that you already know. Here's um, about the, the anxiety and uh, the disturbed body image. There is also some information about um, alopecia and hair loss, what to do for the, the um, risk for infection. Um, in the, in the diet are really important, vitamin C and minerals, just uh, and protein. Um, you, need, you need that just like you do for tissue and take the you need to have the passive section, especially temperature is a big issue. Diet high in protein, minerals, and vitamins, so we keep saying the protein. And then, um, alright, in, um, the when to call for help certainly do read over that. I think it makes sense, but that's what we need to, to teach our patients. And I also put down um, the peripheral neuropathy. You can have this pure seizures, the tingling or numbness in the fingers or toes, sort of like um, vitamin D12 deficiency can cause. Um, you can have um, a decreased blood pressure and, and um, erectile dysfunction. This is just a Nutrition, the small frequent meals, cold, bland, or semi-soft um, or liquid, if, especially if the mouth is sore or it's difficult to swallow. Uh, but small meals more often, and grazing is really one of the things that's a good thing to, to eat, to keep things around the hot protein, like, like cheese, it's from tolerates and um, lactose and food, and, um, uh, foods. and then uh, managing nausea with nausea and then pre-medication compared to the cows. Also, we have to get a lot of pre-medication for the four. There's a chart of eight countries with eight. Um, and it talks about how um, nans are trying to go to. There's lots of sources for uh, nans are trying now that the their friends. Um, they can keep a food di diary. And, and if possible, um, or if needed, you can teach them how to do the parental nutrition, the TPN at home, if that's what's required. We don't really see that a whole lot, but, but it, it, can, it could be done in the worst case scenario. Okay. And. Things just get worse. <laughs> okay. So then care tissue can be integrity, tea, you can be different than you from the dog map. Because I think this is stuff you already know just in the context of the, um, of the cancer situation. Okay, on this, and y'all can certainly, you know, look at what some of those outcomes can, can be um, with setting the goals. 
But I want you to look at your, your, um, your notes page on this for the rehabilitation. You don't need to know that thing about the diagnosis to extend the survival and permanent the survival of them. That's just an FYI type of thing. And uh, cancerad.org is, is one of the websites that I told you to just look at. But then look at the definition at the beginning of the notes page about the rehabilitation. It's like it's an exemplar of something we're supposed to be teaching you about. So I do want you to be familiar with what that involves. The client regaining strength, recovering from surgery, radiation therapy or chemotherapy, learning to live with an altered body part or clients, and recovery from associated psychological and emotional issues. Those are those are goals. That's not going to be realistic for every patient, but overall that's the goal. Those are goals of rehabilitation, and that, that is important. And um, know that the, that the um, uh, cancer advocacy dot or the National Coalition for the Cancer Survivorship that they are advocating for quality cancer care for all people touched by cancer, and um, they want to they, they advocate um, with legislators and everything. So they advocate with Congress and state legislatures and local health departments and whatever. So they they really are the the ultimate advocacy group. Okay. All right. This, I got to jump to children because this is, we do have to do some statistics on that. This is maybe a little easier than it is for the um, adults, but it, it's just been this is a big thing that is just dropping. Um, it's decreasing um, this by about 0.9 percent per year since 1997. So um, the cancer incidence has increased, but the mortality's decreased, and so that, that's just a pattern. And again, that's, I'm not going to ask you that, but we just it's just an FYI. Gosh, my God. Okay, I do want you to know that leukemia is the main cancer in children. And then the second one is brain and other um, neurological, other nervous system, sorry, other nervous system cancer. So leukemia is absolutely number one. The, this type of leukemia is, is the, the most frequent in children, acute lymphocytic, you don't have to remember that until we get to the leukemia unit, but just leukemia and then the second brain and, and um, other nervous system. And what do you think the, the first cause of death for kids is? Yeah, and then the second is cancer. So. But it is, the leukemia um, is the um, is the most common, or the cancer is the most common um, or the leukemia is the most common cause of cancer death in children. I can get that out. It's the most common cause of death. Of death. But they, they really have a, a, a much better cure rate than they used to. Leukemia accounts for the most cancer deaths in children, comprising roughly a third of cancer deaths among boys and girls 0 to 14 years. And you don't have to remember the statistics, but just that leukemia is the, the biggest influence. Okay. Uh, and then the, this, you don't have to, this is an FYI, absolutely, just so you can sort of see in between what the different age group rate is. So that, that's just something that people don't want to memorize. Okay, and then, all right, it's the leading cause of disease related death in kids younger than 15 years. Um, and the other thing that's so important, that's why I've got it in yellow, all children and adolescents with cancer need their care coordinated by a pediatric oncologist. Doesn't mean that their pediatrician, regular pediatrician, won't be involved in the health care, but the, the coordination needs to be from the, um, the, the oncologist, pediatric oncologist. So that is a separate animal altogether from, the, um, from an adult oncologist. It is a whole different deal because of the, the growth and everything that is going on in the time. What happens when you kill cells and children? a lot more cell division than, than adults do. So um, the child's reaction part is, is a good idea. That's sort of the growth and development part that's on the that, um, notes page. So I just sort of look at that. And I think you've sort of seen some of that before, but maybe not in relation to, to cancer. So so just read through those with the infants and toddlers, preschoolers, school age, and adolescents. And if you can kind of um, read over what your um, your etiology can be, that the children end up um, having more cancer than um, they're, that, that they were maybe born with. They had the chromosomal abnormalities and things like 
that to, to begin with or gene abnormalities or immune system abnormalities um, maybe in the birth. So it's not as much related to environmental exposure. It can be for children, but, but they usually have other things going on that can, can make them more susceptible. And know that um, Down syndrome which is, that is a uh, um, chromosomal abnormality for um, number 21, it's trisomy 21, but I mean, just know that it's a chromosomal issue, but it also makes makes the, the children, even though they, they, are, they have the retardation and everything and some of the, the physical characteristics, one of the, the risk factors is that they, they are more susceptible to leukemia, so I do want you to know that. Um, and there's not, let's see, there's not as much, um, program cell death um, in children. It's not as well developed, so that may be one reason why they, they have a harder time with certain kinds of cancers than, than adults do. And then this, these um, these are some external stimuli, like, like um, DDS, that when if mothers take, take that and it's a problem that the fetus is still growing, that can cause some cancers um, later on in, in the child's life. And then that they've got exposure to for another cancer um, with chemotherapy or immunosuppressants because of a transplant or something like that, then they can um, that can, can cause a, a risk factor as well. Um, and you can get leukemia and thyroid cancers with radiation exposure, and and they kids can actually get skin cancer sometimes too. That's that's really not not common, but you do you do see it sometimes. They do not have as much immune surveillance. Um, and they, they are more susceptible to problems with viruses ca causing genetic mutations, and then if there's a, if there's a familial kind of thing, then, then that can be a, a problem as well. So you can look at some of those details in the, um, on the notes page, but that, that's not anything you have know, to specifically numerize. Um, okay, and then these are some of the same things that you, what we saw, saw some of that in, in the little Charlie Brown thing. She's probably anemic, anemic, and she had a fever, infection, bruising. Um, she didn't have a palpable mass, but those that certainly, certainly could be. So, um, and there, there are some diagnostic tests for kids in the, the maternal child book. And I forgot to look up to make sure I had the same page that you do in that edition or the same table. But if, if look at the diagnostic test table, because I, I usually use this the same London book, it just might be a different edition. I might not have the exact table. Um, but the, the teaching highlights under cancers and therapy in the maternal child book is a good thing to, to look at. Okay. And I do have the information about this A and C again. And, and again, you can just read that. We're not going to deal with it right now because we've got, got so much else to remember. But that, that is something that we want to, um, to make sure to watch for the children. Is that, that we've got a high kind of look. Okay. And then you need to, to look at the nutrition in the child with cancer and the maternal child with cancer. Um, this is part of that. That's 1882. I hope that's right. It should be closing that. And then the reporting the events um, for, for pain and pain management. And I got page 1585 and 37. I just do have some good charts on that to differentiate a little bit differently for children and adults. Okay, and then the, this is really important these, on this particular slide. These are just some very, very basic things about taking care of or preventing cancer in kids. This new sunscreen, increase the fruits and vegetables to at least five a day, discourage smoking for the teenagers and avoid secondhand smoke for, for the young kids and, and teenagers or anybody. And teach about the screen and test for early detection and vaccinate against HPV. That's, that's really making a difference in avoid having a fever rate. And that, of course that's for something later in their life, but it, it really is, it is a help to, to people. Okay. These survivorship things, that's what I wanted you to, to look at on this. This is American Cancer Society, childhood cancer, if you want to, to know more. But there are sur surgical, radiation, and chemotherapy long-term um, effects. And, and uh, of course, their brains developing, and their bones are developing, and their organs are growing, and, and all that. And, and the treatment can certainly damage those normal cells. So, so that's why it's a... It's a whole different animal that we can deal with um, for survivorship, um, especially the people that, that had childhood cancer treatment. Oops. All right. Well, this 
the um, adult survivors of childhood cancer need support for the rest of their lives and there needs to be really, really good communication between the treating oncologist that, from the child or at least to have the, for their, their general practitioner that they may be following them for the rest of their lives needs to know exactly what they've had and how much they've had and all that sort of thing so that they can, they can, um, they can bridge that gap between the, the oncologist and, and their, their adult um, medical care. And these are some things that you can see. Poor memory, disorganization, low IQ, and inadequate emotional control. That can, that can be an effect of, of uh, childhood cancer treatment. Okay. Um, and they, these are just statistics, but look at all those things that they can have. Osteoporosis. The, the statistics aren't as important. But the, the, the fact that, the, that these kind of things can, can happen. They have steroids as part of their treatment. Um, that's, that can be a, a big issue. So osteoporosis, scoliosis, heart disease, stunted growth, premature menopause, mm. chronic pain, infertility, hypothyroidism, and secondary cancers. Um, so, so anyway, that, those are those are really, really, really important. And we do recommend, though, that if if, if it's been all possible is to have the kids stay in school or at least have tutoring going on so that they can keep up and not have to be like a year behind their, the people that they started school with. Because that, that's a real big self-esteem kind of issue. This, um, oh, sorry. <coughs> the Institute of Medicine report, and I know that says 2003. I had a student last year saying, oh, I saw that was 2003. That's older than five years, so that doesn't matter. Yes, it does. This is like a breakthrough. Institute of Medicine is, has a lot of clout. That's that's who's saying that you need to have a BSN to be practicing as a as a registered nurse by was it twenty twenty three or whatever. That they, yeah, they they got a bunch of clout. Obviously, they they decided that the focus of treating cancer is promoting lifelong wellness, and and that's not the focus just to treat the cancer. You want to be promoting lifelong wellness, getting the person to be as optimally well as they possibly can to reach the, the greatest wellness potential that they can. So promoting lifelong wellness. Do do remember this. Mark this. This is very really important. Um, and you, you really start like discharge planning kind of thing at, at diagnosis. You know, and, and so you, you do want to do that for, for planning for survivorship as well. Um, and on this notes page, it also says that in 2007, the Children's Oncology Group, this is something I want you to, and that's, that's been a while back too, but this is very important. They kind of, this was sort of a breakthrough thing too, but they, they publish a guide for follow-up care, um, and it's a, available at the Children's Oncology Group website to have that posted. But um, what, what it is, is they, they, um, it, gives, it gives information for, um, for the primary care practitioners to take over the care of, of children. So that, um, and, and it's not really just for, for children now, that they've they branched that out for adults that they're having treatment and have some late effects from treatment as well. That um, every facet of survivor care and patients and parents can also receive information on late effects. But um, survivorship is, uh, all of the journals I get now, there's just, it's all over the place with survivorship needs. So um, this this really, really is big in, in cancer care. Now is, is how, okay, what do we do now? We're, we're done with our cancer, but now what? You know, and, and, um, and the communication between the, the cancer care practitioners and the ones that actually um, resume the care as far as the primary primary care for the rest of their lives. So so that that's that's the biggie on that. And I'm sorry I have to so much. And I know we're almost done here, but I think if y'all if y'all will work together and I will get y'all some computers, if y'all can work, do 